Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the George Washington and Ayanta's Professional Certificate in Cultural Heritage Tourism, today's information session. This webinar will be recorded for viewing later and the PowerPoint will be shared with you as well. My name is Bianca Mitchell. I am from the Pueblo of Acoma and currently serve as Ayanta's Education Manager. Ayanta's mission is to define, introduce, grow, and sustain American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian tourism that honors traditions and values. For those of you who are not familiar with Ayanta, Ayanta provides the technical assistance and training needed to keep our communities engaged in tourism and hospitality. We also facilitate conversations on the economic and cultural importance of a healthy hospitality industry, while highlighting the importance of visiting authentic American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian destinations, as well as generating awareness, interest, and demand for these destinations to domestic and international travelers. One of the greatest tools for our outreach and promotion of tribal tourism is our destination website, nativeamerica.travel. If you are not listed on the website, please contact us so we can get, um, get help to get your listing on our website. As a reminder, please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A and we'll get them. Uh, Stephanie, who's one of our presenters, will get to you. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. We have Judy Walden, who is a cultural heritage tourism instructor and president of Walden Mills Group. We have Kristen Lamoureux, another cultural heritage tourism instructor uh, with Virginia Tech University and Stephanie Westhill, Strategic Program Advisor for the International Institute of Tourism Studies, the George Washington University. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie, and the ladies for being here today. Thank you, Bianca, and thanks everyone for attending today. It's great to see you uh, virtually this morning or afternoon for some. Uh, next slide, please. So we're, today we're going to talk about the Professional Certificate in Cultural Heritage Tourism and just go over a little bit of the program structure and then I'm going to pass it over to my fellow panelists to go through a little bit of a sneak peek for some of our course content this fall. Next, next slide. One more. So this is a completely online program. There is no in-person um, component to this. So this can be taken from anywhere uh, in the world. It is mostly on East Coast time, um, but that doesn't mean that when you're traveling, this doesn't, uh, this, this would still work for your parameters. Within the program, there is six courses and they are provided within eight weeks, consecutive eight weeks. There's about approximately six hours of work per week per course. And this is a professional certificate. This is a non-credit, non-degree program. Next slide. We use an educational platform called Blackboard. Um, some of you may have used it with other professional certificates that we've offered or maybe in your undergrad or uh, graduate program degrees as well. And we open each course on a Monday, and then we close each course every Sunday at midnight. Next slide. And so what that really entails each week is that you'll have one live main lecture, which is usually hosted on Mondays at 12 p.m. Eastern, but that is up to the instructor of that specific course, which we'll get into a little later. They're approximately an hour, but some do last an hour and a half. Within Blackboard, you'll have what's called additional readings for your course, which usually takes about 1.5 hours to get through that. And then there's a live guest lecture, which usually is on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern as well. They're usually an hour as well, but these both the main live lecture and the guest lecture are recorded. So if you can't attend one of these, it doesn't hurt you. It doesn't mean you don't pass the course. It just means you can view it at a later time through the platform Blackboard. We do use Zoom for the actual lectures, um, but then you can, you can find the recordings on Blackboard as well. There's a discussion board about the topic of each of these courses. Usually we ask that you participate and it can take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour as well. And then each of these courses has an assignment, which can take about 
an hour and a half to complete. And then we do really recommend that if you've missed any of the lectures that you go back and review that before you try to tackle the assignment. And then the other component on Blackboard is that we always like course evaluations after each of the six courses. That just gives us feedback on what content is really relevant for you and your organizations at this time. Next slide. This, since this is a professional certificate program, the grading is on a pass-fail system. Um, so you must pass all the weekly assignments and participate in the discussion boards to complete each course. And then once you complete all six courses, you've completed the program. Now, if you um, have travel or you have just things are piling up at work, we do understand that you are all are working individuals, and sometimes you do need extensions for assignments. Um, so if you've missed an assignment in terms of a due date, you'll be notified within the break week if you have outstanding assignments or discussion boards from the program manager of this actual uh, courses and program itself. And in the Blackboard functions, there's a My Grades, which you can check on that as well for pass fail. Next slide. So this is the program schedule that we have for this fall. So the first three courses would be um, offered during September dates. Then there's a break for the IATC conference. Mm -hmm. And then the other three um, courses are provided in October. And then you have that week for completing any assignments that you couldn't get to. Um, for prior weeks. Usually we do like to recommend that students try to complete as many assignments within the week of the course so that they don't pile up at the end. But again, we understand that everyone is a working individual and sometimes that's not possible. Next slide. And then this is the last slide before I turn it over to Judy to talk a little bit about some content for the first course. But just wanted to give you an idea of what, who, what guest speakers we invited last year, just to give you a little bit idea of the breadth of people who come and speak to the um, cohort. And the other really cool thing about having a live cohort versus a self-paced program is the peer-to-peer -peer interactions that we see that come out of this program, not only with your instructors, but with your fellow um, students inside the program. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Judy and next slide. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I would say before I start that um, the information that I bring in the in the uh, intro to international to cultural heritage tourism comes from my own experience. Um, I left at one point um, higher education where I'd been teaching and working as a college administrator and just wanted to be an international businesswoman. And I decided the best way to get there was through heritage tourism and specifically cultural heritage tourism. So um, I've been through every process um, of deciding what kind of a business to have, um, who I needed to partner, partner with to make it happen, how I could raise the money to get started. And then finally to saying, here I am in business um, do I really understand yet how tourism works? So one of the things that I'd like to say at the onset of this uh, course is that not only are we talking about cultural heritage tourism, but we're talking about tourism in general. And no matter what part of tourism you're in, whether you'd like to develop a product for yourself, whether your tribe is producing something, or if you're a person who works for the National Park Service or other partners, you need to understand how tourism works as a system because it's a vast web of partnerships, which you'll hear not only in the introductory course, um, but from each of the other five instructors. So with that in mind, in order to survive, I had to learn the system of and really ask myself the question, how do you make money in tourism? So that's going to underlie all of the things that we talk about. You've got a passion. Um, most people who come to the course have a passion for saying, um, this culture should be shared. Part of this culture should be shared. 
but now what to do? So my concern is at the very end, you've not only met your goals in terms of, of sharing a culture, but you've met your goals in terms of understanding whether you've stepped into something that's going to give you a return on investment. Next slide. <clears throat> so what is cultural heritage tourism anyway? Um, some people use the term cultural heritage, others use um, heritage tourism. But in terms of the industry itself, um, when it started about 15 years ago now, the term cultural heritage tourism embodies both. And it basically describes traveling to experience the places and activities that authentically represent stories and people of the past and present. It includes historic, cultural, both the people and the intrinsic values of the resources that are there. So the most important part of this slide to remember is that if you're doing cultural heritage tourism, you're having people, most people are as keenly interested in contemporary native culture as they are in the heritage of the native culture. So one of the ways in terms of where is, what are the trends, where are things going? People are very interested in learning cultural tourism, but also having the opportunity to be in the outside, be active, be interactive. So you'll, you'll be seeing that as you see what kind of new things are being developed. Next slide. Okay, um, cultural tourism is one of what I call the isms. The first ism was ecotourism. The latest ism is dark, dark skies tourism. And what are these niche markets? Well, if you have, it as, if you have a, the name of a specific kind of niche tourism that ends in ism, it usually suggests that not only does it have to do with what you'll experience, but that there's a greater purpose beyond just bringing in money. So ecotourism was first for most of us, right? And it came out of Africa, it's got big in Southeast Asia and South America. And it basically said, is it possible to have a kind of tourism that actually helps save the resource? In the case of safaris in Africa, right? Better to save the lion for the next person to see on a safari as opposed to shoot the lion in the short term. So don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. This is really what started ecotourism um, at the beginning. My first experience in ecotourism was on the Amazon River. And um, this morning I opened the, the paper and there's a picture of the pink dolphins. A perfect example of, is there anything tourism can do to help save a species or help save the land? So that's ecotourism. All right, then came sustainable tourism. It has to do with how much of the most beautiful things, the most precious things are being used up in the name of tourism. Sustainable tourism and ecotourism are now well integrated into mass market tourism. Then came cultural heritage tourism. People said, you know, I really am interested in the human aspect of this, okay? Human history, human contemporary life. Then National Geographic stepped in and they said, we're going to do, uh, we have something that we're calling geotourism and it's an umbrella. It includes ecotourism, cultural tourism, heritage tourism, and they went out in the world and started um, actually working with locations and regions to make geotourism maps. So started putting things together as opposed to saying we're talking about one thing. Next group were a group of poetic men, believe it or not, from Prescott, Arizona. And in the most poetic ways, they said, the real expression of tourism should be to help your place on earth 
your destination, your community be more of what it wants to be. That's what to aim for in tourism. Very profound. Next, we had culinary tourism. Um, and people started saying, look, we travel on our bellies. I would go any place to eat special food. And culinary tourism came forward and quickly became linked with agritourism. What's the difference between agritourism and culinary tourism? With agritourism, you're also interested in the farm or the farmer. Um, in places next to the ocean, you're interested in, in the fishermen, the fisher people. Okay. And then volunteerism. I went to a destination wedding um, in Mexico, and I was a day early because the plane was cheaper that day. And there was another guy who said, oh, you're going to that wedding too? I've been here for a week. And I said, well, what have you been doing? He said, hiding out in the bushes. I said, really now? He said, yep. I've been coming for years and I work with a turtle project, right? Hide out in the bushes, wait until they come up and lay their eggs, right? When the mother turtle's gone, I snatch the eggs and take them to an incubator. And I've been doing this so long, I have my choice of week, right? My choice of place, I'm at the top of the volunteer heap. I pay for my tickets, I pay for my lodging, I pay for my meals, and I contribute to the turtle project. He's in volunteerism. You're starting to see this with many travelers saying, I, I'm re we're ready to travel and not only do no harm, but actually contribute to what a place needs, what a destination needs. And finally, um, the most current of the isms is the dark, dark skies tourism. And it talks about being in a place where there's enough light, where you can see the Milky Way. You can see the stars you need to be, right? And included in that is the rights of nature. Just to say you're making it dark, not only for our pleasure in seeing stars and seeing the dark sky, but the rights of nature to have a dark cycle to their day-to-day -day life. So that's the niche markets. It's a way to bring people and to connect with what they care about. But in all of these cases, the elements of the other kinds of tourism are all there as well. Next slide. Now the, in cultural heritage tourism, it's really a combination of combining tangible assets and intangibles. What are tangible assets? There's some place where you can actually see and touch something, okay? In this case, this is a picture of um, a world heritage site, uh, Mesa Verde National Park, um, and it's in Cortez, Colorado. It's managed by the National Park Service, managed beautifully. It's been open for years. Um, and the protections that are in place are truly amazing. You can still climb a ladder, you can go to some places, not other places. And there's not only a guided tour, but there are also written to, there are also um, interpretive signs throughout, even coming up to the site, um, a museum and archives. It's a well-protected place. But, Okay, so that's a tangible asset. I'll tell you another tangible asset, which is just over the top of the Mesa. Um, there's a place there run by the Ute Mountain Utes. And it's another cliff dwelling, place of cliff dwelling, which has not been excavated or changed. And only tribal members may go um, with people. If this is their business and to take visitors with them to the cliff houses. So once living in Denver, I had a mother and father who came to see their college son who was living next door to me. And he brought them over and said, can you tell them where to go? I said, well, what would you like to see? And they said, we're really interested in native cultures. I said, well, how about Mesa Verde National Park? And they said, well, that's nice, 
You know, what we'd like to really see is something authentic. So what do you mean by that? Well, we want to make sure that we have a chance to talk with Native people. I said, okay. And off I sent them to um, the Ute Mountain Ute experience for half a day. They made the arrangements. They had half a day. And when they came back, um, the mother wept with gratitude. She said, this is the best day I've ever had traveling any place in the world. And basically it was one guide in the rented car that they'd driven in with. And he took them to the site, gave, gave them his interpretation of the site, answered questions, and they had that one-to-one -one connection. Next slide. So those are the tangible assets. Anything as well organized, right, as the Nas a National Park Service and a National Heritage Site or something protected differently by a tribe, right, and offered on a one-to-one -one basis. But the, the assets are the same. Now, the intangible assets, this is where it gets interesting because so many tribe, tribal people, native people have at the, at, at the outset of tourism making the big decision. What is it that we're willing to share with travelers? And what is it that we're not willing to share? And, you know, it's a process that we wish every destination went through. You know, Venice has suffered sharing everything and saying, oh, we lost our place. So one of the things that, that is so important is to decide which of these practices um, concerning um, not only spiritual, but practices with nature, oral traditions, music, storytelling, um, culinary practices, which of those are shareable that will do no harm and which should be kept um, for the individual and, and for the culture to which, they're, to which they belong. So this is very interesting. And um, what you're really looking for in cultural tourism is what I call a high value traveler. You're looking for travelers who appreciate who you are, um, what you have, and are willing to pay, pay a fair price to experience it. So um, this is kind of the heart of, of uh, the, the, the development of cultural heritage tourism. Next slide. So tourism has really moved um, from people say, oh, you're in tourism. They think, oh, you're marketing. Or let's get into tourism. And they think, oh, we've got to get a marketing program, right? But tourism, that is an important, essential part of tourism. But in tourism management is really starting from the very beginning, saying, who do we want to come? Who are we going to target in our market? Who are, who are we targeting? How do we find that high value tourism? person, that high value traveler, right? And then as you work your way through each of these, each of these uh, steps, getting to here's what we're going to offer, right? And get to the end of, okay, we're ready to market it. First thing you have to say is, how are we going to make tourism sites come alive? How do we focus on authenticity and quality, which is expected? if you're in cultural tourism. After we get underway, how are we going to make sure we've pre preserved and protected things that are sacred to the place, right? Our natural assets. And finally, how do we infuse everything that happens so when they leave, you feel like you've had a meaningful experience? So before we go to the before you go to the next slide, the meaningfulness I think sticks with me in terms of something I learned from the tourism department 
department in Alaska. By now, this is probably at least eight years ago. And I said, well, what kind of research do you have in terms of who's coming, you know, for native tourism? And she said, oh, we have good, we have good research. I said, tell me about it. She said, well, as you know, it's easy for us to get at travelers who come in and out of, of Alaska. You have to, you have to fly in or float in, in most places, right? So we have access to, we know when people are coming and where they're arriving and we have really good access for research. So we did, um, we did a program, she said, two years ago, which basically asked people who were exiting. They'd had their vacation in Alaska and they left. And they started with the first question to say, are you planning to come back to Alaska? And if they said yes, they said, if you, if you said yes, would you answer these questions? What did you do when you, what, are the main, what were your main activities when you were here this time? right? And uh, the men answered pretty much fishing. The women said, you know, fishing and hiking and right shopping and blah, 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 blah. And then the second question was, if you returned within five years, what would you like to do that you didn't get to do this time? And the men said, fish with a native guide. And the women said, shop for authentic native arts. There it is. They had a great time. They're coming back. They want more. They're looking at a little more infusion of meaningfulness. Last slide. Okay, so it'll be, this is a process. Looks like one, two, three, four. But each one, right, is each one has to be taken care of. Even if you get to the point you're already marketing, you have to go back and reassess the potential, organize yourselves differently, right, and say, do we have protection in, in, in place? So the process, this four steps goes on and on. The, uh, in the first course, um, one of the things that we focus on will help you assess the potential of a project that you know about or are involved with. As you go through the other five courses, you'll also have a way to analyze what you're doing and measure what you're doing. Okay, so at each of the five, at each of the six levels, the one thing that you'll be talking about is partnership. Um, so. Um, I'll leave it at that. But if you're planning to do tourism and you're planning to do it alone, right, it's, an, it's overwhelming. For each of the steps you get to, you need different partners. So you're developing a web of partnerships. So I'd like to leave with um, the idea that cultural tourism doesn't have to be a big project. Um, it doesn't have to be a whole destination, right? It can be one experience that sticks with you. And here's an experience I'd like to end with that has stuck with me. As a matter of fact, I thought about it um, yesterday when I was going through my slides, I went, oh. so here's why it sticks with me. This is a, a carving shed um, at the Jamestown Squalum tribe. It's called the um, House of Myths. It's a carving studio. And they do carving not only for the their own tribe, but they do they do it commercially for others. So I knew about the Jamestown Jamestown Squalum tribe because they have a wonderful um, art studio where you can purchase native arts not only from the Olympic Peninsula, but from the entire coastline up into Canada. And um, I'd been to, to, to that art studio probably and, and shop probably five or six times before I figured out that I could visit the carving shed. And when I got there, here were three men working on a totem pole and area was roped off and they carved and talked. And that was the experience. You could wander in and wander back out. 
So I started, I was asking questions. There were two other groups that kind of came in and out while we were there. I said, God, where'd that tree come from? How old was it? What did you pay for it? Are there others? Are the other trees protected? Right? Do you, does everything have to stay with the tribe or does it go to other places? And on I went. And I was with two other people. They asked questions. And as we left, the fellow said, okay, um, thanks for coming, but I'm feeling kind of disappointed. I said, how did we disappoint you, right? Or why is that? And he said, well, I keep waiting for somebody to ask the 14th question, thought it might be you. That was it. I have thought for years about the 14th question. What didn't we come up with? Right? We found out that they'd paid $2,000 for it. it. came from the whole reservation. Right? That other... I'm, I'm not sure this was... Uh, we said, if it, what happens to the other trees like it? Oh, he said, we sell them to the pencil factory, which I think was, you know, a metaphor. They become anything. I'm still thinking about it years later. Slide still evokes that for me. What other question should I have asked? Fantastic tourism interaction. It's an experience I had, cultural experience. So with that, I think we'll, um, I'll end this part of my presentation and hope that we have time for questions. So, Kristen, over to you. Thanks so much, Judy. So, um, <clears throat> welcome everyone. It's just a really, it's just really great to have you all here and um, to be able to answer any questions and share information about this program that Judy and I have both been teaching in since its inception, right? And um, so next, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my course, Tourism Planning, and just just so you know, all of the instructors. As you'll see on the website, I just throw up my slide, but all of the instructors are, are extremely qualified individuals. Um, personally, I've been working in tourism for, I now put, I don't even want to say the years, I just put the plus after 25, because at this point, I don't want to say how many years it is, but um, I've been working in tourism. I was fortunate enough to be one of those people that was able to um, be part of uh, IANTA and what, what IANTA was doing way back when. Um, back almost at the beginning, not quite at the beginning. And I've been working with um, Native, in, well, Native communities in the U.S., Indigenous populations around the world. For most of my career, I'm currently working um, with some of the tribes in Montana and some of the tribes in Virginia on some tourism experiences that I can certainly share as we get in. And part of the thing that I've been involved in recently is helping to form the uh, Montana Indigenous Tourism Alliance, which we just won an award at the Governor's Conference, so we're very excited about that. And I'm a member of the Indigenous Tourism Alliance of the Americas, which is an excellent group for those of you that are interested in connecting with um, beyond just the U.S. Indigenous Tourism Partners. Judy did a great job of, of talking about probably the most important thing, which is partnerships. And, you know, we have partnerships in uh, the person next door or the business next door. And then we have partnerships in, you know, another community in Central America that's doing similar things and we're sharing best practices. So there's there's partnerships all over and it is very much how tourism does develop. So next slide, please. So, <clears throat> yeah. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my course individually uh, and, you know, we're happy to answer other questions. Judy did such a great job of giving the overview of what we're talking about. You know, cultural heritage tourism is, uh, especially Indigenous communities, it's one of those um, very special types of tourism that really needs to be planned. Um, I think in the beginning, when tourism was developing, tourism just happened, you know. Coney Island just happened, you know, they built some amusement park, an amusement park, people just went. Um, the World Fair happened and people went, you know, they planned the World Fair, lots of people showed up. 
Um, and maybe they knew how much of a draw and how long the draw would be on their destination, but maybe they didn't. You know, it wasn't until later um, in the last century that we started seeing tourism marketing offices and what's known as a destination marketing organization now, but, you know, these planning offices. Um, and even then, they weren't necessarily a, co a coordinated effort to kind of think through all of the aspects of tourism. It was simply uh, awareness and marketing, as Judy mentioned. And, you know, where we are now is we, ve we very much know that tourism is one of those things that can be done well and can really have lots of benefits. Uh, but it also can be incredibly detrimental. And so uh, one of the things that we do in, in the planning course, in our very uh, our second course, so after the introduction course that um, Judy provides, we go into a fairly, somebody said this is very methodical. And I had to think about that for a while if I liked that term or didn't like that term, but a fairly methodical approach. And I do like it because I think if you're willy-nilly doing things because They've popped up because it's an opportunity. Um, you can you can be drawn in a lot of different directions. And so what we do in this course is we take uh, a fairly community-based or uh, business-based business level approach to assessing where we are um, in the tourism process. So we'll start with a destination re review. Um, learn, you know, how to develop a tourism plan, um, and then begin with the very first kind of step is what do we have? What is our assessment? And so starting with the information that's readily available, a lot of this is there are, there's lots of information readily available, and then looking at um, what information do we have to go out there and find? And often when we have to find information, um, and for those of you who are not lucky enough to live in Alaska, where you have the great data that Judy mentioned, often entry data and um, visitor data is a little harder to come, come about. But even if you have the data, knowing what to do with it is important. So we, we rely on stakeholders or partners. Um, some partners are willing partners, other partners we have to kind of um, help to engage the process. I was working um, up in, this is probably 20 years ago in Crow uh, in Montana. Um, and um, I met with um, an elder council to talk about tourism. And um, they were uh, not opposed, but also not really understanding why anyone would wanna come to Crow to see anything that they had. And so part of the engagement of the, that stakeholder group, and it was a fascinating day for me, but it made me realize that, you know, there is a lot of internal marketing of tourism and the opportunities um, for tourism and what people might be looking for within the communities. You kind of have to build that awareness first, often in a lot of communities, and then start talking about, you know, where are we, what type of visitors do we want? We don't have to accept everyone that's come in, that's showed up. Um, we don't have to develop tourism products that are um, to the masses. So we can be more specific and we should be more specific. Um, so engaging stakeholders and then using this assessment process, this methodical process to kind of build recommendations and next steps and figure out where you're going. Um, and then once we're kind of done with looking at the, the assessment process, which is the first stage of planning, then we would look at, okay, so we have this plan, this, this assessment. Now we can start looking at, um, you know, how do we want to develop tourism in our community? And what's realistic? Sometimes when we're doing a tourism assessment, we have a lot of great ideas. We don't necessarily um, have the um, all of the resources to develop these type of tours. Maybe if an area is very culturally sensitive. Maybe um, there are times of the year uh, that we don't want visitors in. Um, working with um, the Blackfeet, sorry, the um, Salish Kootenai Nation in uh, Northern Montana and their council and their elders have made it very clear that they're not really comfortable with a lot of visitors in their forest areas. Um, very welcoming people love to have visitors, but there's parts of their forest that is part of their process, sacred areas, and they, they don't want visitors. And so knowing that and being very clear in that, we can develop around those areas 
think about the types of tourism that might develop in different places and also protect those areas that we want to keep off um, everyone's radar because they are private or sacred or belong to the tribe or whatever else. So all of that happens once you um, go through the process of knowing what, like I always say, you can't, you can't build something when you don't know what you have to begin with. And so this class is really very much about knowing what you have to begin with and then planning and planning to manage it based on that. So with that, I think that I'm gonna turn it back over to Stephanie and, um, and we're happy to answer any questions. Each, as Judy said, each one of these classes is going to take you through a portion of, um, or a step or a cog in the wheel of tourism development. It's not easy. If it was easy, you know, everybody would be doing it. Um, but in order to do tourism well, appropriate, protect culture, protect sensitive areas. It really it really takes a multi-step process, which is um, part of what you will learn in these classes. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me and I will turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Judy and Kristen. It's so nice to have a sneak peek about what the course content really can entail within this program. I really appreciate both your um, time today. And Bianca, could you go to the next slide? So right before we get into the Q&A session, I just wanted to let everyone know about the registration details. Um, so we do use a registration uh, platform called Cvent. So that is the direct link in order to register for this six course program. Uh, thank you, Sherry, for putting that in the chat as well. And then there, the program fees are up on that slide as well. We do have a little bit of a discount for IANTA members. and. I'm going to now open it up for Q&A. Um, if you don't feel comfortable coming off mute, you can put it into the chat. Um, and if you want to direct your question to a certain person, just uh, tag us in your question. Stephanie, I do want to mention that um, IENTA is going to be um, offering 10 Native Act scholarships for this course, and we will be putting the link up on our website um, by the end of this week. We're trying to get it up as soon as we can, but just want everyone to know that IENTA is offering uh, 10 scholarships for this program. Also, I know that MPS is offering their staff uh, scholarships. There's availability of 10 scholarships as well. So a total of 20 scholarships are available. If you have any questions, please let us know. I did want to mention that before we end. Yeah, and then Bianca, can you switch to the next slide so we have the contact information up? Yes. Thank you. Yes, so um, that is the GW email that is a direct inbox to our staff over at the Institute. Um, and then uh, Bianca has put her information as well if you want to um, talk to her. Oh, the scholarships are full. I see that question in the chat. A full payment, sorry, not partial payment. I should specify for others on the call. Any other questions? Uh, talk through the dates. Um, Bianca, would you mind um, heading back over? I think it's like maybe slide 12 or so with, yep, yeah, perfect. And then uh, the discussion room requirements. So that actually is by um, the program coordinator as well as the instructors. So when it comes to discussion, it's really about um, within the course and what the instructor wants the discussion to be. Uh, I have not taken these courses, so maybe Judy, if you wanna um, jump in as well to kind of talk through maybe one of the discussions that you've held or Kristen, if you wanna jump on that question. I'll start Christian, uh, Christian send it on to you. The, the discussion is such an interesting part of the program. Basically each instructor um, stimulates the discussion with a question. So it relates obviously to the topic, you know, of the course, and then basically stands back. And our expectation is that every person um, contributes a question and enters the discussion. 
not in a social media gee whiz way. Oh, cool. I'd like to know more about that. Doesn't count, right? More in an active listening way. Oh, I, I read that you're asked, right? You asked about this. Um, how does this work? Or you asked about this. I'd like to share something we have here, right? In Oklahoma, um, et cetera. So the discussion has really brought forth the experience and the questions that everybody brings to the table. And my best example is, uh, I guess, two years ago when we were deep in the pandemic um, and the course went on, and all of a sudden, people on the discussion realized that there were quite a number of them from places in Alaska that were stops on the cruise ships. And the cruise ship industry had come to a complete stop. And all of the communities are saying, okay, now what? And they, out of that discussion, out of, in the class, out of that discussion, they formed their own work, their own group, um, and carried it back to Alaska and used it as a, as a way to solve problems and come up with some new ideas they hadn't had before. So six instructors are one thing, you know, another 40 or 50 people that have experience is just immeasurably valuable. Question? Yeah, I think, you know, as Judy said, we're we're really not hoping, we're hoping, it's, it's not homework per se, like when we were all back in um, high school, um, we're really hoping to not only engage you in answering the questions and the discussion, but so that you can start to learn from each other. Um, we, we have a, you know, I know some of the folks that are in, in the participant list and I know their level of expertise is amazing, you know, and they, they have much to share, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know everyone, but some of the folks that I recognize, I know each one of them has really, really, really valuable information to share. And so the discussion is really in uh, a question, you know, usually we start with an introduction, you know, please introduce yourself and then a question about the topic, um, but inviting you, as Judy said, to share. And then a uh, secondary question might be around um, the guest lecture and also inviting you to share um, your thoughts or comments or additions or recommendations um, with each other based on the guest lecture. So it's not onerous. Hopefully um, you find some benefit in the communication. Um, and yes, th there was a question whether this, I'll just go ahead and answer. Is this a remote question? Um, it is completely online. Is the, the program remote? It is completely online. Um, it, we have live lectures, a live lecture and a live guest lecture every every class, every week, but you do not have to, we'd love it if you did attend live. We understand time zones and everything, it's difficult. So we ask that um, you watch, you either attend live or through Zoom or you um, watch the recording, either is fine. As I think Stephanie said, you know, we, we're not gonna penalize you for not attending the lecture. In many ways, it'd be like missing out on a great gossip se session, right? I'm just amazed at what, what comes out. Yeah, and you know, we've had it's, in the past little happy hour, not, you know, virtual happy hours and stuff, and yeah. it's great, great information is shared. You know, you kind of become a cohort. You share information, you learn from each other, you learn from the instructors, um, and then it just builds your, your network, your partners, your folks that you can, um, you can call upon. I can take the class sec, uh, question. How many, we had a question come through the chat. How many people are in the class? So that really can vary. So sometimes a cohort can be 25 people. And then I think one year we had 60. Um, so it really just depends on how many incoming students we do not, we've never capped it, but I think probably 60 was quite a bit for the instructors and for the program coordinator to manage. Um, but I guess we, we would love to be challenged if we ever had to cap the course. <laughs> Any other questions before we um, end our webinar today?
don't think we have any more questions coming in. But I just want to put up the slide again with our contact information. If you have any questions that come about, let us know. Email us or give me a call. And um, just want to remind everyone that the um, this session is being recorded and will be available um, in about a couple of days. We'll get it up on the website. So if you wanted to review the content again, you may do so. And um, yeah, okay, there was one question about cost, a second question. Oh, total cost per program. Let me bring that slide back up. So it just depends on if you're a member, um, it's 2,725. And for non-members, it's 2,775 for the non-members. Um, but again, there, there are 10 scholarships available. And um, we'll, I, I'll actually email that information out to all the registrants as well that signed up for the webinar. So you'll have that information on hand by the end of the week and with the link for that um, scholarship information. Um, anything else? Thank you. Thank you to Judy, Stephanie, Kristen. This was a great presentation and um, we look forward to working again with you this year for the Cultural Heritage Tourism course. Did anyone else want to add anything? No, we just look forward to seeing you in the fall. <laughs> yeah, always a, great, always a great experience. We can't wait to meet you all. Yeah, it'll be great. Well, thank you. And we're going to go ahead and end this uh, webinar. But again, if you have any questions or need more information, please visit our website at ienta.org. Thank you all and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Bye. Bye-bye.